with the Asus Zenfone 5 capturing a lot of media interest lately for being a fairly inexpensive Android phone that has flagship level features like a AI-powered camera, as well as a nearly full-screen display for not that much money, I wanted to take a time to revisit another phone that from Asus that probably many have forgotten about. Hello everyone, here at OS Reviews, you're watching our retro throwback review of the Pathphone X. So the Pathphone X is a phone that came out in 2014, and it came with the quad-core Snapdragon 800 processor. This was a SoC from Qualcomm that was definitely ahead of its time when it comes to performance and efficiency, and that's a good thing because now, uh, in 2018, four years later, it still holds up actually quite well in terms of day-to-day -day use. You'll of course notice some slower speeds than the fastest and latest flagships on the market, but all in all, still handles itself quite well. So the reason why the pad phone is unique, as the name kind of suggests, is the phone is sort of modular in concept. Essentially, we have a phone that basically has the brains, the processing power, and there's also a separate tablet portion that came as a bundle deal. Uh, in this case, the pad phone X came with a nine inch tablet, which had these pretty bulky bezels, but you could simply slide it into the back panel of the tablet and transform it into a large screen viewing experience without having to re-download games and resync all your data. So you could have just one phone with, of course, your 4G connectivity, as well as Wi-Fi or your apps, and just transfer back and forth between a large and a phone form factor, at least that was the vision. This is a concept that wasn't completely new to the market. We saw it originally with the Motorola Atrix, which was a phone that came with a laptop. It was a laptop form factor, and it was slightly better in terms of productivity, Alright, so taking a closer look at the phone's design first, the X was really nothing uh, to write home about, but it does have a design on the front at least that reminds me a little bit of an Apple iPhone with its uh, proportions of the top and the bottom and placement of the earpiece as well as the uh, front-facing camera. So there's a 5-inch display on the phone's uh, front. It's an IPS LCD screen with pretty vibrant and punchy viewing angles. On the bottom, there's just the Asus logo. On the very edge here, we have a micro USB port for charging and two points, which you can use to insert into the pad phone dock to more securely lock it into place. The phone has kind of this trapezoid shape when you look at it from the edges, which uh, may seem like metal at first, but it's actually just painted plastic. In fact, that's definitely one of the weaker aspects of the Padphone X would be its build, because back then it was still the norm for Android phones to be made out of plastic and was perfectly acceptable, even Samsung did it. Of course today, even mid-end phones are being made completely out of aluminum and we're having higher and higher standards for build, uh, but still the Padphone X feels quite comfortable in the hand because of its lightweight form factor and its soft touch rubber which provides a pretty good texture and grip. On the very back, there's a 13 megapixel autofocus camera with an LED flash, and we'll discuss that later on the camera portion of the review. There's also a loudspeaker, which is pretty unfortunate in terms of placement. On the top, there's a standard 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. On the side, there's a volume rocker, a power key, and that's pretty much it. So a pretty, pretty clean and traditional uh, interface. So turning the phone on, we see a very heavy customization on top of Android 4.4 KitKat. So a little outdated there, but everything still works in terms of apps and uh, software uh, that you would want to install, including games and productivity titles. The software skin on top of Android is called Zenfone UI, and uh, Aces have kind of redesigned the way the icons look, as well as the track down notification shade. It's quite colorful, and oversized icons make up the uh, majority of the menus that you'll be looking at. There are a few nice touches, such as the page visualization uh, and other elements here and there that you'll find are redesigned from the ground up, including a universal search, in addition to things uh, like custom utility tools, such as a clock, which are pretty thoughtful and coherent with the overall look and aesthetic of the phone. But other times, uh, Zenfone UI tries to do too much, just like with Samsung's TouchWiz. However, on this particular phone, it kind of makes sense because in order to make all the docking magic happen, it's not going to be compatible with a regular version of Android. So Asus actually has proprietary software on board, which optimizes the screen to fit onto a larger panel and then back onto a phone uh, simply by docking it without having to reboot it. So all of this happens behind the scenes. Uh, and in this case, it's not a huge problem. All right, so taking a closer look at apps that are built on in, because the Asus Padphone X was originally a phone that came on contract with AT&T here in the United States, and it sold for a price of $200 with a two-year service agreement. That was actually a pretty good deal back then if you're considering a flagship phone with the Snapdragon 800 series chipset. Uh, and also the fact that you get not only a phone, but a tablet uh, as part of the bundled $200. 
The phone is fully stocked in terms of connectivity. So you have 4G LTE, there's Wi-Fi, there's GPS, Bluetooth, NFC for mobile payment for Google Wallet, and there's even wireless charging. So you can remove the back cover and you can see a contact point on the back plate, which is why it's made out of plastic. All right, so let's take a quick look at the camera. The takeaway is the quality is a little bit inconsistent. It's hit or miss. Uh, sometimes in certain lighting environments and also in complete darkness, it actually does a pretty good job. Uh, so in particular, the darkness one sounds very fascinating and that's because it uh, actually captures multiple images and stitches it together to bring in more light as well as to give you a sharper image. There's a lot of processing going on, but it's one of the more interesting modes that we've seen built onto a phone, especially one that's four years old. So if you go into, uh, let's say, mode, you can actually tap on something like low light versus night. And the low light effect um, is the most drastic. If you're in places with only a single LED beam, it's able to make the shot look like it's captured almost at daytime, which is impressive. Now I say inconsistent because you can see how in this shot, uh, the window with the light here, you know, the it's pretty overexposed. It's almost white looking, you can't see any details at all, but certain areas of the image look okay. So uh, it doesn't perform the best when there's a lot of complex lighting. And this image as well, you can see here that there isn't too much uh, great detail as you zoom in and colors are a little bit dull. HDR does also work pretty well uh, when you are trying to capture, again, uh, landscapes. So in shots like this, you can tell how the vibrancy of the colors are captured actually really well. So again, you can definitely get some good images out of this uh, camera and it's more than sufficient to share on social media. In fact, you'll be pretty pleased most of the time with the details uh, as well as the night vision shots that you can get. But it's not going to be as consistent as, say, a Samsung or an iPhone sensor, which is, again, a tall reach considering that this is priced at a fraction of those other flagships even back in the day. A quick web browsing test and we're just using Chrome right now. You can tell that this is what the built-in keyboard looks like from Asus. It has predictive text but it's also very unconventional. There is swipe built in as well um, so there is that but uh, you can tell that the keys and the icons are a little reminiscent again of iOS so there's a lot of inspiration from Apple uh, with Asus but Overall, the experience is still good because the touchscreen is very responsive, and again, the Snapdragon 800 still is quite responsive in terms of processing speed, so there's not too much lag or delay. Other phones, of course, with the Snapdragon 800 include devices like the One M8, also the LG G Flex, and those are still phones that have aged really well. The performance is quite stable, and today, if you try to install a custom ROM or uh, you know, updated to the latest version of Android yourself, you can still find it to be a comfortable daily driver. So there's really no complaints in terms of general performance of this uh, Snapdragon 800 power device. Um, only slight downside would probably be RAM. There's two gigs of RAM, which was a lot back then, not anymore. We now have phones with you know eight gigs of RAM and higher. Uh, and on mid-end devices, we commonly see four or six gigs. So that's quite a leap. And of course, it means that we are now used to smoother transitions between different programs. But on here, if you have more than let's say 10 or 20, it's definitely going to get a lot slower uh, in terms of performance. You can uh, take a look at that by accessing the RAM manager icon, virtual keys below the screen here to swipe uh, and close down apps that you don't want to use. Time for a quick test of the speaker and audio, as well as the video playback. So the speaker quality isn't outstanding. In fact, it's a little bit on the tinny side, also not too loud, even at about 80 to 90% volume. So a little bit disappointing. Placement, not so great either. Definitely one of the weaker elements of the Patreon X overall, I'd say. All the other elements have held up quite well, and I am fairly impressed uh, you know, for a device that's a flagship, but priced more like a mid-end or entry-level phone if you take a closer look. So 
that's basically more or less it as far as all the core features on the phone are considered. Um, next, I'm just going to take a quick look at the tablet and show you guys how the transitioning process works. So basically when you're ready, again, you just slide it into the back of the pad phone dock and within seconds, it basically comes to life. The mechanism for the sliding action is actually incredibly smooth and there's no resistance at all. So it's a very cleverly engineered and designed from ACES. Um, it just really seems like a very comfortable and natural motion. And five seconds later, you're greeted into the, f the same experience, but on a more comfortable view with the tablet's display. Um, the only downside here really is the bezels of this particular pad phone station. Actually, on the original pad, Aces pad phone, which came out about two years prior to this model, it had a larger display on the tablet with smaller bezels. And if we just do a quick size comparison with the Huawei MediaPad M5, which is a 8.4 inch tablet that was just released, you can really tell the huge difference there in terms of dimensions. The MediaPad is just a lot easier to carry and transport with you because of its slimmer bezels. Again, this is a 8.4 inch screen versus nine inches. So really not that big of a difference if you put them side by side here, but you can see a pretty massive difference in terms of bezels. This is more of the size that you'd expect from let's say a 10 inch tablet even back then. So not quite uh, the best choice there from ACES. But the saving grace, of course, is you do have the front-facing speakers, which takes up a little bit of space by design. And as a tablet, of course, it's a bit more comfortable to grip this way as you're holding it. So one of the reasons why the Pad Phone series probably did not fare, you know, as, as successfully as ACES wanted, otherwise we'd be still seeing it today in newer productions, would probably be the A, transitioning process, being not as seamless as ACES wants you to believe, and B, the fact that it's still a kind of bulky experience. If you take a look at the tablet from the rear here, along with a standalone tablet, you can just see the difference in the thickness. Part of the reason is because the docking station has an integrated 5,000 milliamp hour capacity cell of its own, which is able to recharge the, the smartphone up considerably. Uh, so you can just take it with you basically as the added uh, power bank for the phone, uh, which is nice, but it adds a bit of bulk. There was, however, an optional Bluetooth keyboard accessory or a folio case that you can get to make it into kind of a laptop form factor, which makes a bit more sense, um, in my opinion. So the reason why I say the uh, switching experience isn't as seamless as you would probably want is largely because of uh, some of the Google apps. And you're watching back this video here, which, uh, by the way, uh, actually looks quite good because the screen here is, again, IPS. Slide the phone out, right? But unfortunately, no, that's not the case. It says, dynamic display. YouTube does not support dynamic display. You can restart the app in the phone mode. So you have to end up restarting it and then searching back the video again. But with YouTube being one of the kind of primary apps that you would want to use it for switching between a tablet's large screen and a phone's smaller display, you would think that they want to get this working, but unfortunately it never was something that was rolled out even with updates. And again, uh, kind of the fault of Asus there when it comes to supporting it. Yeah, considering again, the Pad Phone series was a, you know, a series of phones that we saw over three or four generations and it was never really resolved in that time gap, which is a little bit disappointing there. However, if we take a look at the custom browser, which is based on WebKit, but also designed by ACES in terms of the software as well as the interface, this one does support the dynamic switching. In fact, it's one of the few apps that does. Um, some of the games and titles you have to also reload or reopen when you switch them back into the tablet. But let's say I open up this page, it's right now on AT&T. Again, very seamless sliding into the tablet. And within a few seconds, we have, again, uh, the same exact page being loaded up. And again, the tablet's accelerometer is still working well too, so it can switch back and forth. Sometimes the pages will take a second to re-render, but it's remembered what page we were on so we can continue scrolling without having to search up this page once again. So that's more or less it as far as our kind of retro throwback look at the Pad Phone X and kind of the Pad Phone line from Asus in general, just because it's a, a very interesting experiment on the idea of convergence as well as a modular phone that could be the center of all your computing needs. It has all the brains, all the guts. You can connect it to I.O., like a tablet, uh, into a keyboard, transforming it into kind of a small workstation. And although it was never fully resolved in terms of giving us a super polished experience, the Pad Phone X was very cost effective and um, even though Asus's kind of newer phones like the Zenfone 5 are definitely a step up in terms of performance, in terms of sleekness. I would say that this is definitely something to still keep in the back of your mind if you're trying to look at something unique uh, and if the price is low enough. I would say under, let's say, uh, $60 and you're trying to pick up a backup phone or a mid-end device, it's still something that's uh, worth considering 
more closely. So you can take a closer look at more details in the description box below, but for now, this has been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That's been our throwback review of the Aces Pad Phone X, a transforming phone and tablet two-in-one device.